Hey, happy new year, everybody. Hey, I just want you to take a second and think about something for me. Get out your phone, open up your notes. In less than 30 words, I want you to write down how you would describe your holidays. Now, I'm talking about the cumulative experience of the big three, Thanksgiving combined with Christmas, combined with New Year's. And while you're thinking about it, let me tell you just a little bit about mine. Over the last several weeks, I've had water flood out of my kitchen sink into my kitchen. I've had water come through my kitchen ceiling in a whole separate event. I've been to Kentucky and back to North Carolina, then to Florida, back to North Carolina. I've been to a funeral. I've celebrated a birthday. I've had an anniversary and I've topped it off with three different Christmas celebrations. Now, let me ask you one more time. How would you describe your holidays. Uh, Were they hallmark worthy, exciting, stressful, restful? And now that it's over, how do you feel as a result? If you're like me, that six week period of time that every TV network in the world paints as a picturesque and, and tranquil experience ends up leaving you feeling more tired than you were when it started. I mean, that magical time with family is almost always preceded by hours and hours in the car. Those magical moments with the grandparents really only serve to take your little angels and turn them back into the little devils you work so hard to train. At least one expensive part of your car or your house broke and you probably spent more money than you told yourself you would last year. Am I the only one? But all of that, it's behind us now, isn't it? Now, this is our first worship experience of 2022. It's a new chance for a new direction. And we have a brand new opportunity to live life in a brand new way in a brand new year. And the way we usually go about this is with the ever popular and always infamous New Year's resolution. Now look, I'm not judging. I make most of them most years. Even this year, I made a few. So to get your wheels turning on how you should spend your next 12 months, let me share with you Time Magazine's top five New Year's resolutions. Number one, lose weight and get fit. Number two, quit smoking. Number three, learn something new. Number four, eat healthier and diet. I make that resolution basically every Monday. And number five, get out of debt and save money. Now here's my guess. At least part of your list sounds a lot like or maybe entirely like this one. But before you get ahead of yourself, start patting yourself on the back because you made the top five list, I got a little bit of bad news for you. This is Time Magazine's list of the top five most broken New Year's resolutions. And often we try to undo a year of decisions with a few moments of consideration that lead to a few big and most often empty promises. But this year is different than the norm. This year's holiday craziness comes on the heel of almost two full years of upheaval. There was the first three months of COVID when everyone lost or thought they were going to lose their job. There was the next few months where everyone who didn't lose their job decided that they should change their jobs. People across the country who had seemingly strong and dependable jobs found themselves for the very first time depending on on unemployment. We worked, uh, we learned and adjusted to work at home, work from home with our kids. We learned to do school at home. We learned changes in our ways of life. We felt anxiety about the future, dissatisfaction with the present, adjustments to new norms, social pressures, masks, material shortages, vaccines, a booming and rapidly appreciating real estate market, economies taking changes, cryptocurrency came on the scene, and civil unrest was almost everywhere. To minimize the often overlooked personal and spiritual impact of the last few years would be foolish at best. These last few years have changed all of us but we have a new year ahead. And with it comes a new chance to begin again. So today, I want to look and learn from the life of one of the most powerful men in the Old Testament. His name was Elijah. And if anyone knew what it was like to find himself exhausted from the activities in their past, it was him. See, we could spend all day talking about the big, enormous things that went on through Elijah's life, but we're going to pick up today in 1 Kings chapter 19. Here's what we find in this pivotal moment for Elijah. 
Just moments before, Elijah had just won this amazing victory. He had gone toe to toe with the king and queen of Israel who had led the entire country to turn away from God and worship idols. The betrayal alone was bad enough, but the religious practices of the idols that they led the country to to follow were unspeakable. You wouldn't find a sailor talking about these things. And Elijah gets the king and queen and all of their prophets to agree to a showdown between the gods. Each group called on their own God to do something incredible as a sign to the people that they were legit. And after an entire day of worship, self-mutilation, sacrifices, the 400 leaders of the other religion received no response from their God. And at this point, Elijah calls the entire nation to pay attention as he prays a quiet, humble prayer. And in response, God does something incredible. He sends down fire in a wild display of power, proving that he alone was the only God to be worshiped. At this point, Elijah leads the people of Israel to not just run out, but actually execute the 400 prophets of this God called Baal, winning the battle and paving the way for Israel to return to the one true God. Now, this sounds like a great day if you're a prophet like Elijah, right? There was just one problem. The prophets worked for the king and for the queen. After months of confrontation, a showdown, the victory, and a change in the hearts of God's people, Elijah was tired enough that what happened next nearly took him out. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses one through two says this. Now Ahab, the king, told Jezebel, his wife, everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow, I do not make your life like one of them. That was a death threat of the worst kind. Now, this was not the turn of events that you hoped for, was it? Worn out, tired, and exhausted from the stress and adrenaline of what had happened over the last few days, Elijah, the man of God, responds in a way that no one would have seen coming. First Kings uh, chapter 19, verse three says this, that Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. See, I heard a quote from a guy talking about Vince Lombardi and this was the quote that he used. It said this, that fatigue will make cowards of us all. And maybe over the last few years, you you look back and fatigue has set in and you've made decisions that you wish you could have a redo on. You wish you could go in a different direction or make a different choice. And if fatigue can take out a man like Elijah, here's what we have to recognize, that it can take us out as well. See, Elijah hits the road and heads for the hills, but along the way, he runs out of steam and he literally falls asleep in the middle of the desert. And what I love is that even though he was running away from where God really wanted him to be, God remained good and faithful to Elijah. Here's what we find in verses five through nine. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey's too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. See, here's the thing that we need to understand. The circumstances of our lives, whether they're good or bad, do not change the character of God. I've said it before and I'll keep saying it. The foundation of all great theology is that God is good. Whether we're winning in life or losing, whether life is easy or painful, we can have hope because even though we live lives that change, our God does not. Things turned quickly for Elijah and he reacted in the way most of us would. Elijah got busy. He evaluated the situation. He assessed his own safety. He determined his own best response. And in his mind, the only thing left to do was run. So he ran and ran and ran and ran. And along the way, he had a few brief encounters with God. And while God was good to this fearful prophet as he went, God wanted better for Elijah than a few short run-ins. But we can learn something here. The simplest thing to do when life gets busy or heavy or stressful is to just 
do more. We get up earlier, we stay up later, we get more done. When necessary, we reprioritize our health, our fitness, our rest, our relationships and our family. And we set what needs to be done over top of all of those things. Our first reaction to a heavy load is to straighten our backs and just push harder. But this in no way takes into account a God whose character is good and whose heart is for us. God is for you. He's for me. And in these kind of moments, we need to remember this the most. In these moments, we settle often for brief encounters with Jesus, just like Elijah had. We wake up, we say, hey, God, help us today. And we move about our business. And we set aside time in his word. And we set aside time to intentionally listen to him in prayer. When there's work to be done, my personal first reaction is to get to God later rather than reach out for him now. But I love the opposite approach that the great church leader, one of the early church fathers, Martin Luther had. Hey, he said this, I have so much to do that I'll spend the first three hours in prayer. Why in the world would he say this? Because stress often comes in the moments that matter most, moments that define us and the moments that carry greater weight than the ones when it's easier to let God be a part of our lives where he simply fits in. Left to my own devices, I'm likely to take these moments into my own hands and make a disaster out of them. In these moments, I need God's voice far more desperately than the moments where I have extra time just to listen. Now on the other side of the showdown, the victory and the threats and the running, Elijah finally finds his destination and he arrives. He goes inside a cave and exhausted from the journey, he falls asleep again. But when he wakes up this time, things are different. It was quiet. Things were still. Things had become calm. And in this moment, God speaks up with words that haunt me every time I read them. Listen and imagine God saying this to you. First Kings 19.9. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now read between the lines. Elijah, this is not where you're supposed to be. This isn't where I wanted you. I had something planned for you, but you've missed it. Elijah, what are you doing here? So Elijah responds exactly how he was feeling. If you don't think you can be honest with God, read this next statement and understand God wants the truth from you. First Kings 19.10 says this, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put to death your prophets with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Basically what Elijah's saying is, God, I've been working hard for you and things aren't getting any easier. Life has gotten tough. We hit some roadblocks. I've been trying to bring the people and, and, and God back together. I've been trying to get you two to make a deal. I've been trying to pull off a merger between God's people and God himself. I've been grinding and grinding and working and working, but God, I'm not getting anywhere. So God tells Elijah to do something strange. He says, leave the cave go wait outside and I'll come close. Here's what happens. Verses 11 through 13 tells us this. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, I love what God does here. He takes a prophet running from a swirl of activity in his past and he sends him out to wait in the middle of another swirl of activity, wind, earthquakes, fire, all the things that we think if God showed up in our lives, these things would take place. But God wasn't there. What does it say though? After the fire came a gentle whisper. It's as if God was reminding him, Elijah, you didn't need a 40 day escape through the desert 
you still have a chance to hear me. You didn't need to run all the way across the country just so you could hear my voice. You could have heard me right where you were. And it was here with the activity set aside that God finally had enough of the attention of Elijah to tell him what to do next. First Kings uh, 19 verses 15 through 17 says this. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Yehu son of Nimshi king over Israel and anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Maloah to succeed you as prophet. Yehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael and Elijah will put to death any who escape the sword of Yehu. One of the words we use to describe God is omniscient. When you boil it down, it means all knowing. This means that there is nothing that has ever occurred to God. He already knew it. There is nothing that we have ever realized that he did not already know. And there is no new news for God. What this teaches us is what Elijah learned in this moment, that God is never without a plan. Are you in a crisis today? God is not without a plan. Do things seem unclear or uncertain? They might to you, but not to God. Again, God is never without a plan. That isn't to say that our desired outcomes and God's desired outcomes are the same or that he always has a plan to do what we want to do. But what it means is that God is never caught off guard. He's never wondering what we should do next. God always has a plan. And God had a plan for the crisis that Elijah found himself in. There was a leadership problem in Israel and God not only knew what to do, he knew who he needed to do it. The next king for the north and the south part of Israel were already in place. God even had a replacement plan for his worn out, tired prophet named Elijah. Now think about this. Did these people materialize after Elijah ran and finally got his quiet time alone with God? Absolutely not. God's plan was in place long before Elijah's worry turned into fear that turned into panic that led him to run away and retreat. The only thing that failed was Elijah's willingness to stop, to wait, and to seek God in the midst of the hurry. In taking matters into his own hands, he nearly missed out on what could be done when God took them into his hands. See, I love what A.W. Tozer says. He says this, that God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. So it's a new year. What in the world does any of this have to do with a new year? Again, this is the time of year when we look ahead and we get to redetermine what our lives are gonna be all about. We get to choose lofty goals and we get to set our sights on achievement and accomplishment. But what if, what if this year was measured by something else? What if it was a year not measured by the scale of our achievements, but by the consistency with which we pursued God, his leading, his presence, and his voice? What if in doing so, we unlocked that greater potential that Tozer talked about? Instead of leading our best lives or businesses or families as best we know how, what if we allowed God to work in us and through us to do the impossible in all of those areas? What if God's desires became a reality in our lives because we chose to flip it upside down and make pursuing him our number one priority in 2022? What if this year was the year you became confident in discerning the leading and direction of the Holy Spirit for your life? What if this year finally was the year when you became convinced that God was really good and he really could be trusted because you spent that much time with him? What if you put to rest your doubts this year that God loved you and you woke up each morning understanding more and more that in your worst moments, Jesus still died in your place as immovable proof of God's love for you. Does that sound good to anybody? It does to me. So here's a resolution I believe that could change your life. It could change every other resolution. What if we resolve together that five days out of seven, everybody needs a margin for error. Five days out of seven, we started our day, no matter how early it had to be, by waking up, 
reading God's word, talking to God about what's on our minds and spending enough time to listen for how he might respond. Would you make a commitment like this with me? In the midst of the noise, the demands and the movement of daily life, you can start each day with the God who knows just what to do and just how to do it. This could be different than every other year. So join me and see what God does. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would make your voice alive to us, not just today, but this entire year. God, I pray that in doing so, you would change our priorities. God, you would enable us to hear your voice like never before. You would change our hearts to be like yours. And God, more than anything else, we would get to know you at a personal, intimate level. We would know your character, what you love, what you despise, and what you desire for our lives. Lord, would you work that miracle in our lives? Would you meet us every morning we wake up? Amen.